All right, we're back looking at uh, David's 1500 horsepower, 6.7 liter. Uh, there's enough people that comment and said, I would like to see the cylinder head. So I am gonna go through and show you guys the cylinder head. Right here, uh, obviously I've cleaned it up and pulled it apart. Valves, I'm gonna show you the valves are running, springs are running. Some of the springs stuff is, um, I'm gonna omit some of that information because it's not as just as easy as throwing these springs in there. There has to be some modification done and, and it's for certain things, but I'll explain why we use that style of spring. <clears throat> All right, so on this side, it looks like just a regular generic cylinder head other than uh, we did put the thread in frost plugs here so they can't pop out. We did put a set of, of new guides in it last year. All right, so this side has a little more done, but we do have Something I'm talking with David about, we're gonna have to do a little bit of figuring, is she got a pretty good crack in it right there. And there's no one more cylinder too. Well, actually, number five and number six both have, these heads always crack and that number, like in between the exhaust is where they like to crack. So this is not an uncommon thing. The issue is, is that you're not gonna make the crack better. So, you know, I think that we can run this head for another year and then we'll have to do a different head for it next year. Um, there's a couple things that you can do to make sure that um, your seats are staying retained and all that type of stuff. Um, because that's the thing is, is that when they crack like that, the biggest downfall when it happens is that it, it can unload your seat and your seat can fall out. Now there is some stuff you can do to prevent that, uh, but that's the biggest problem. And eventually this crack will go into water, but it has to go like way up. It's gotta go like way up in here before it gets into water. So most of the time that's not like the biggest concern, especially on a race truck. If it starts to use coolant, then you know, it's either blowing a head gasket or this um, is going on. So it is what it is. Now you can see that this is a much bigger, so this is a factory valve, it, uh, it no fitty. Like it goes way in there. So the factory valves are, uh, now the, these are not exact measurements, but just to give you an idea, a, a, a factory valve is 33 millimeters. The valves that we are running are 36 millimeters. Now these are both 45 intake and exhaust for your valve seat angle. And they're made by Ferrera. These were a custom valve that we had made. I don't know if I had them made or if somebody else had them made. And the, anyways, these are the ones that we used anyways. Uh, I had them in stock and at the time, the company that I would normally get them from did not have any in stock and I had these ones sitting on the shelf. So we used them. There's nothing wrong with these valves, very good valves. Um, now something, I don't know, it's gonna be hard for you guys to see it, I think. But if you see on the, the edge of that valve, see there's like little clean or like little funny colored spots on it. That's actually aluminum. So David had a turbocharger explode on him and that gives you an idea, um, the, like the dust and the micro pieces of the compressor wheel when it blew up, uh, definitely made its way into the cylinder head and would have made it in, its way into the engine. You know, that's the, the hindrance. That's also too, I was looking at the pistons, uh, inspecting them a little bit. One of them actually has a crack in it and then the other one, um, the, there was two, I think, or three that had pin bore problems. The pin bores were just not perfectly round anymore, which inherently is what's going to happen to something like this. But, um, also on the skirts, you know, like if you guys go back and watch that, if you haven't watched that video, there's some scoring on the skirts and that scoring actually, I was playing around with it is actually aluminum and bits and pieces of the turbocharger, uh, which probably some of is maybe the ceramic, uh, ball bearings is actually what's embedded in the cylinder or in the, the piston. So if he would have continued to run it, uh, definitely would have had a cast rock failure. So it was a good thing we took it apart. Uh, now on the seat side of things, these seats are the big dog seats that everybody uses. Everybody uses the same seat for the most part. This is what the seat looked like to start with. And then I bored the center of it out because, well, we want all the airflow, right? And then we de-shrouded the valves and all that type of stuff. So if you, this one, yeah, this one. So we set the valves in there relatively deep and then, and then we 
um, deshroud the valves and stuff. I think on this year, I'm actually going to deshroud the valves more, and then I'm going to put a swirl edge on it. When I do that, I'll show you what I'm talking about, just to help that help it swirl a little bit more. It's not going to hurt anything anyway, but uh, nothing super crazy. I think we had all this the depth set at 65, so the, the valve depth was at 65, I believe. Um, that's something we can verify, but I'm pretty sure it was 65 intake and exhaust. And you can there again play around with a bunch of that stuff, changing it. Um, when we put this engine together last year, uh, we were in a time constraint, so it was like I knew that the specs that we used would work and we wouldn't have problems, so that's what we went and did. Now, the tighter you can get tolerances and all that stuff, and um, you can play around with that, get more airflow and all that type of jazz. Uh, it's well worth the time to do it. The problem is, is that you have to have the time and the customer has to have the ability to pay for the time. Not that David couldn't pay for the time, he just didn't have the time. And obviously the engine worked because it put in, it put in lots of work. Um, what else did I want to talk about on it? So the last, so last year this is the head that had on it, the year prior to this one, um, it actually still had, did it, oh, we did put, we had these valve seats in it because that's actually the one that's in his uh, shorty now, or not shorty, his um, flat deck truck. Uh, we used these seats, but we used factory valves. So we used an, an intake, for the intake and the exhaust, we used a um, factory style exhaust valve. Now that does work, nothing wrong with that. It's way cheaper than doing it the other way. Um, but obviously the bigger valve, you're gonna get more airflow. No matter the scenario, well, I shouldn't say that. Your port will have a will have a, a restriction point at it. I know that the bigger valves in these definitely help because this thing definitely worked better than it did the year prior. It is an expensive upgrade. I think the valves are like $1,100 US for the set of 24, so they're not cheap, right? So it is what it is. Now, valve springs. This is the valve spring that we used, which is, um, it's for a different application. Like the spring is for a different application than the retainer and then you need different, different keepers. But the reason we used this was for a couple of reasons. Now, if you have your valve depth, the deeper in there, the farther the valve is gonna stick out of the head, right? So if you, um, how do I explain this? Ah, I can do it right here. We use this 6.4 head or 6 liter head. Now, the deeper you put your valve, right, your recession on this side, the farther your valve stem is gonna stick out. Now, it's not just the valve stem that you need to be worried about, it's also the seat pressure that you have. So your installed spring height is what we call it. And it's versus off of, well, you can't really see in there that well, but basically off the, where, the, where, the, where this side of the spring sits, and where your retainer sits, like this, the gap in between here. Now, you need to know, one, that when your cam, whatever your camshaft lift is, you need to have about 50, 60 thou clearance before coil bind, at least. Um, there's a more to it than that, but you want 50, 60 thou clearance there. Now, if you have way too much clearance, the issue with that is, is it now takes spring pressure off the valve. Now, if you're you know, in the performance world, you know that you want a higher spring rate valve to help control the spring, or to con you need it to control the valve. So you don't want the valve, I'll see if I can find the clip of that on a Spintron. I don't know if I'll be able to find it or not. If I can, I'll put it in. Um, but basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to stop the valve at high RPM from bouncing. So it's going to, that's the wrong valve. Basically what it's gonna do is bounce like this. Like obviously it's a micro bounce, bounce but it's gonna kinda do this when, the, when it hits the seat if your spring pressure isn't high enough. And you don't want that. You want the valve to open, stay open, because you also don't want it, that's for the reason that you wanna almost come to coil bind, is you don't want the valve and this or the spring when it oscillates when you open it the spring is doing one of these inside there and you don't want it to move up and down very much because then what happens is the valve goes like this up and down you don't want that because basically you're you're i don't know how you would explain that oh i know how so if you take a hose and you step on the hose right the water's coming out the other end the water goes 
Well, the air is gonna do the exact same thing. As this is bouncing, up, moving up and down like that, we're talking micro, right? But going up and down like that, you're going to have um, airflow is gonna go like this, up and down, up and down. You don't want that. And then also too, you need that valve to come in and when it hits the seat, you don't want the valve to do that. Now, obviously like the timing is not there, but the reason you want the valve to come in and close and stay closed as long as it possibly can, not so much on the intake, more on the exhaust side, um, is that you need the heat to come out of the valve and go into the, go into the seat because most of what's going on is this valve transfers its heat through the seat. So if it can't transfer the, the heat, then well, you kill the valve and you can kill the seat, but you're going to kill the valve and you don't want that. These actually look in really good shape for what it is. Like we still got to do a little cleanup and stuff. Um, but everything on this thing actually looks pretty good. Like, like I said, other than the cracks, but that's most race heads are going to come off and they're going to be cracked. Just is what it is. That's the reason that you check stuff. But like I said, there is a few things we can do to, to uh, combat that for a year and still run this head if he so pleases to. If not, I guess we'll be building another head. Uh, but it is, there's a bunch of port work that's went into this thing. Uh, the seats, the guides, you know, like all that stuff. There's, there's quite a few hours that have went into this head. Now we can reuse the valves in whatever head we use, but um, yeah. And then on the spring side of things, uh, we went, I used a, um, a B style, B, I used a beehive style spring for stability. Now, you can use a conical spring, yes. The issue that I found with the conical springs that are readily available um, is that they're just not enough pressure. Uh, they're not strong enough, I guess you would say, for the bigger valve. Because the bigger valve is definitely heavier than this valve. So that is another thing too that you have to take in consideration is you need your spring to be up to the task to control your valve. Um, because that's the point of higher spring rates, but then it's also not just a higher closed rate. There's also different rates as you get on onto the top of the lobe. Um, you're, you need the right rate at that point. And these springs with these valves um, seem to do the ticket. So that was the reason we use those springs. And like I said, those springs, I, I don't want to tell you what the springs are for, and the retainers and all that stuff because everybody's, you know, guys are gonna try to use them and then they're not gonna work and then I'm gonna be the bad guy. So depending on what you're doing, it's all about, you gotta talk to the builder um, and as long as he knows what he's talking about, he or she, I shouldn't say he, he or she knows what they're talking about, uh, you get what you need. So anyways, uh, I gotta, like I said, I gotta talk to David a little bit more about this, see what we're gonna do uh, about the cracky cracky. And uh, yeah, when I go to put this thing back together, I honestly don't know if I'm gonna have time the way I wanted to do to show putting it back together because it is considerable amount of time putting one of these things together. Um, and I don't know if I have the time to show um, putting it back together. So we'll see on that one. Anyways, uh, something else some guys asked um, what he was running for injector CP3 and a turbocharger. Um, and then same with his lift pump. He has a big dog or a, yeah, big dog, but a big air dog on it. I believe it's a 280 gallon, I believe. Um, and then he's running 400% over flux injectors and he's got a 14 mil CP3 on it. And then it's obviously custom tuned. He runs an eight, uh, 849 ECM. But none of this information is like privy information. Like everybody, you know, if you go on the forums and all that stuff, pretty much all of this stuff, other than maybe some of the valve stuff and the spring stuff, um, none of this is rocket science, guys. Um, you know, if you want to build one of these engines, any ma competent machine shop should be able to help you do any of this and you can assemble it yourself. Like last year, um, David assembled this engine. He assembled it here in the shop, but he assembled this engine himself, um, obviously with my, some of my guidance and such, but, uh, and well, it did the job and it worked. Um, but you know, stuff happens and, uh, you want to make sure and check and verify, make sure you're not having problems with stuff. So uh, we'll catch you on the next one.